Hello and welcome to the Malaria Debate organized by the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent. I'm Vincent Landon, I'll be moderating this session. Why are we here? Well, in the last 10 years, we've seen tremendous progress in the fight against malaria, but I don't think anyone's under any illusions that there's still a long, long way ahead. We're going to take stock of the situation today, applaud the successes, but rather more critically, look at what is not working, why it's not working, and where it's not working. We're then going to try and identify some priorities for the next five years and establish what the major challenges are. And then perhaps think about some realistic targets for that seminal date, 2015, um, the deadline for the Millennium Development Goals. But without further ado, I would like to pass the floor, if you like, to Peter Olomese and put to him the question, can you give us an overview of the situation today in the global fight against malaria? Thank you very much. Um, I would certainly try to give a general overview and setting the pace for the discussion. <laughs> um, malaria, like we all know, remains a major public health problem. And, and over the years, a lot has happened. We are pretty sure and clear about the tools needed for the control. And I dare say elimination of malaria. You have treatment with the artemisinin-based combination therapies. You have vector control, that with the use of long-lasting mosquito insecticide treated nets or indoor residual spraying, and other key interventions, specific interventions in pre pregnant women and in infancy. And there are clear targets set. You have the targets of universal coverage by the end of this year, 2010, so we still have some time. <laughs> and of course, you have the target for the 2015. Over the years, a lot has happened, and the picture, the global picture of malaria has changed. Rick Steckerty, we're hearing about developments and tools and interventions and strategies. What are you seeing on the ground? I mean, are we seeing, um, is, does this tally with your experience? At country level, um, the countries that are progressing are doing so because they've exactly followed that. They developed good policies choosing the, the effective intervention strategies that we know. They've attracted the resources, and so it's not that just people are giving them money, but they're actually systematically applying for the money and making their best case for how it should be used. The, the time frame from getting resources to actually procuring the commodities and getting the commodities out into communities is actually faster than we probably anticipated could be done. And, and then the progress of moving those commodities to houses and saving lives is also in being documented faster. So almost within a transmission season, we can see that if they've gotten their coverage up, there are lives saved and there is uh, less, less disease showing up at the clinic, less deaths showing up in the hospitals, and they're not, it's not just because they're dying at home. As a matter of fact, they're just not dying anymore. If technology is with us, I'd like to go over to Kenya and James Kissier of the Kenyan Red Cross. Can you um, tell us a little bit about the home management program, how it works and how it's working? Yeah, um, the home management uh, uh, for malaria program is really fashioned after the, the WHO policy and uh, the roadmap policy of early treatment of fever and um, treatment near at home or near the house to decrease um, mortality and morbidity in children under five, and also to reduce the number of complications um, due to malaria, um, in, including uh, cerebral malaria. Now, we uh, designed this program to have um, a service delivery at difficult to reach areas, it's a difficult access uh, as defined by an hour and a half walk to the facility. In some of these areas, uh, families are having to walk up to seven hours to get to the facility. And so we designed it with the Ministry of Health here and uh, WHO offering uh, technical support to, um, uh, to, access, to make sure that people had access to, uh, to ALs, the anti-malarials. In our initial um, survey, we found that about 23% had access to that, 
to, uh, to ACTs. Uh, at the end line that we uh, just concluded, over 90% of the children that were treated for fever were treated with ACTs. So, so the program they... did increase the access to ACTs and uh, it has reduced uh, referrals with complications to, uh, to the health centers. So, so we'll come, come back later to this whole discussion about these community-based approaches and the significance. Um, but it's one question I would like to throw at you, George. Um, with drugs, are you seeing a similar picture here? With drugs, I'd say where we are today um, puts us in a place for the kind of interventions that, that James has described in Kenya being very feasible. There has been a great advance in the past 10 years of new drugs that can be used in multiple settings effectively. Um, drugs for children are finally starting to be both manufactured by developers and used by countries. So as of today, in a time cut, this is a fairly rosy picture for drug therapy for malaria vis-a-vis -vis 10 years ago when we were staying a lot of resistance to chloroquine and didn't really have a lot of options. So as of today, it's a good picture. The future we'll talk about later. 